Right, good afternoon everyone. Very lovely to see you all back here again on this auspicious day when we have yet more guidance, which we won't spend time talking about. Um, you are all very, very welcome and a big welcome to our returning speaker today. The only speaker to, to speak twice, in fact, Mr. Wells. That's, that's how fabulous you are. Um, we are, we'll start as per usual, I'll um, share my screen in a moment and we'll start as usual um, with some reminders and a prayer and then I will hand over to the lovely David Wells. So our theme for this week, week eight, I can't believe it, week eight is who is in the family of the church with David Wells and I haven't um, done a screen with our reminders but just to remind you all if you're struggling for a signal you'll probably find if you turn your camera off but um, obviously keep the rest on if you turn your camera off it should improve your signal also we ask if you're getting up or moving around a lot um, if you would please turn your camera off as well that would be really good because it saves us all being distracted that'd be very kind um, we are recording the session you should have a, a reminder of that at the top there um, and we will be putting them onto the Edge Chiron website and to the Redemptorist website. And they go on YouTube for both of those as well. So we'll start with our prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are not people of fear. We are people of courage. We are not people who protect our own safety. We are people who protect our neighbor's safety. We are not people of greed. We are people of generosity. We are your people, God, giving and loving wherever we are, whatever it costs, for as long as it takes, wherever you call us. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so our speaker, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, will know David Wells. There are his contact details. If you are interested in having a, a visit from him or a, a virtual input to one of your staff meetings or um, later on in the year, perhaps in person, there are his contact details. But David, you are very, very welcome. Thank you for coming back to us. You are on mute, thank you, <laughs> just to remind you. Um, it's really great to see you. So uh, anyone who's, who's new here, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't think we've got anyone who's new, but if you do have questions that you'd like to share with David or open up to the floor, um, if you pop them into the chat and then I'll encourage you to open up your microphone when the time is right. But also if anybody's um, mentioning any resources, it's really great if you would type those into the chat so that people can write them down and, and see them as well. That would be fabulous. So David, a big welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, it's nice to be back. And uh, thank you for giving up this time. And thank you for you, Sarah, for hosting us. Uh, I'll be brief, but I'll try and cram in as much as I can into 10 minutes. This, if you don't know, know is chapter seven of this book, um, How to Survive Working in a Catholic School. I'm gonna reorder slightly what's in there, but the reason for that will become obvious in a minute. But everything I cover, is already there so if you you know if you want to recollect this afterwards take a look at that chapter um okay uh where do we start <laughs> I love this. um so firstly any gathering that bears the name catholic and please forgive me for saying something so obvious but in a catholic context any community of people uses the language of family if it doesn't, it should. And the root of that goes right the way back to the early church. And it's largely because we're presented with a holy trinity, uh, which has a kinship attached to it. So at the baptism of Jesus, the father declares the son. This is my son, the beloved, you know, my favor rests on him. Throughout the Gospels, and particularly in John's Gospel, Jesus is declaring the Father. This, you know, I and the Father am one. So right at the very beginning, of, if you like, the nucleus of what it means to be a Christian community is kinship. 
it's not organizational management all right or management structure now it's family and you may be aware st john paul ii declared the church is a family of families and pope francis calls a parish a family of families so it's only natural then i haven't found a quote but one will come along eventually that des describes a school as a family of families and you know actually it makes more sense but just bear with it because the problem that comes with this is it can all sound a little bit saccharine and sweet and you go well actually i don't even like all the people here so let's just stop for a minute and say why does the church predicate itself on this notion of kinship or family and what does that look like okay so i'm going to suggest a family is predicated on relationships of love and this all sounds very theoretical but actually you people and i know because i i know some of you make this very real there are two real characteristics of family that i see everywhere i go when i walk into your schools and the first one you'll find exemplified in luke chapter 15 really the chapter is a chapter of lost and found but if i suggest to you you know it's where we get the parable of the prodigal son and here the virtue of family which is different to management structure is perseverance and i just have you ever come across that phrase i bet you have actually that blood is thicker than water all right now why do we say that why do we say blood is thicker than water well the reason is families persevere I mean, we don't always like each other, if we're honest. If you take a long, hard look at your family, and I don't necessarily mean the nuclear family, try the whole extended thing, uncles, aunties, cousins, all that. Actually, what unites them is a sort of unwritten, unspoken perseverance. We really, really, really do persevere with each other in a family. Theologically, it works like this. To the younger son, the father says, nothing you can do will make me love you less. No matter what you spend your inheritance on, I still love you. And to the older son, the father says, nothing you can do is going to make me love you more. You go to mass every day do everything the catholic church teaches i'm not going to love you more than i already do and so we're not caught up either in a sense of failure or in an overburdened sense of duty we're just our father perseveres in utter love of us it's fantastic really you don't get that in management structure you get it in family the second feature i think is tenderness and pope francis talks loads about tenderness it's one of the virtues he mentions most whenever he refers to families and here perhaps a, a parable to to reflect on is the parable um of the of the, the unforgiving debtor you'll find it in matthew chapter 18 and here jesus criticizes the relationship for its lack of tenderness of mercy it's the lion and lamb lying together and by the way it's where francis paces his foundation of his idea that a christian catholic community is actually a field hospital you know I sometimes walk around your school and just look at how much healing is going on. It's it, our schools, in a sense, are hospitals against prejudice, against ignorance, 
against poverty. Our schools are, are places of healing. So in a family, you have this idea that we relate to each other with tenderness and we persevere. I, I, think, I think it's a beautiful understanding of, of why we're a family and not a structure. Now, if I can move on, because I'm keeping my eye on the time, we haven't got long left. Why are these attributes to a family so significant? Well, the first thing is Pope Francis says, by the way, please don't imagine the perfect family when I'm talking about your school as a family. Can you not do that, please? Think about your extended family. I don't know what your extended family is like, right? But just think about this for a minute. Most extended families, if you're fortunate enough to be in one, most extended families have got at least one mad uncle, um, one cousin who always has to do things different. Most families have got somebody who's suffering from bitterness and resentment. And there's normally two, at least two people who are not talking to each other, right? And you go, that's what a family looks like. Don't think apple, apple pie and don't think happy ever after. Think of a family that is messy. And you have closer the notion of the family of your school. Mm, we're not going there now, but just think of somebody probably in your school community that you have to work at liking. And, and you get the idea of, of this notion of a family which perseveres and acts tenderly because families are not neat and tidy things. In fact, you might be interested to know that the bishops in Canada wrote to the parents of all the children in the schools and said, none of our schools expect you to be perfect parents. None of them. So we kind of come knowing that our families are, are not in perfect shape, really, and neither are we. We are a family, but we're not in perfect condition. Um, Pope Francis writes in Amoris Laetitia, no family drops from heaven perfectly formed. So our notion of family is quite inclusive. And that leads halfway through to a really significant part of this chapter, which I love. And it says, if your family is not quite in a perfect state, it's quite likely that it's how it should be. But there's a response to this. And in this chapter, the chapter talks a lot about something it calls servant leadership. This is not just the duty of the head teacher, by the way. Servant leadership is a principle that anybody who's baptized should develop. The scripture to look up for this, and it's referred to in the chapter, is John 13, the famous text of washing the feet of the disciples. And there's something about servant leadership that is badly misunderstood. Um, it is, actually. Because when I ask people, what do you think servant leadership is? It's quite often um, caricatured as, as kind of being kind to people. I mean, that's definitely a feature of it. But servant leadership isn't, um, when you're heading a family like this, it's not a question of, you know, I'm quite an important person, but I am going to wash the cups. All right, that, that, that sounds like servant leadership. But if you read the text and then you begin to investigate, um, I'll give you an example. Um, a friend of mine decided genuinely and in humility that he would join the parish cleaning rota. And he did that because he said, you know, I need to do something which is, which is serving the community, but not particularly noticed. Um, but when he joined this group, he discovered that everybody else in it was over 70. In this case, they were all women. And he said, 
for quite a few sessions, I spent the whole time being told, um, not there, not that cupboard. No, no, that's not how we do it. The other way, the other way. No, no, not like that. And he began to realise that he wasn't truly welcome in the cleaning road. And then he discovered something quite powerful, really, which is sometimes some of us like to serve and moan about it. We sort of get ourselves into a place we call servant leadership, but actually it's quite a nice place. We're sort of doing the work, but berating everybody else. It's a kind of martyrdom, but it's self-martyrdom. It's not really servile. So I'm going to offer you three characteristics of heading up a family in the notion of servant leadership. And these are referred to in, in, in the book. The first is that when you're heading a family, not an organisation, uh, in the context of Christian servant leadership, the object is that everybody around you is flourishing. It's not that your service is visible and obvious it's that the people around you are are genuinely flourishing um, i could give you a couple of daft little illustrations it's for those of you who are head teachers it's that those moments when you look around the staff room it doesn't happen often but it's really beautiful when it does. And you look around and you go, do you know, um, these people, they're doing it without me. It's kind of, you look around occasionally and you go, this, this is a good place to work. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that. That wouldn't be your fault. But there are odd occasions where you could almost stand back and go, do you know, um, it's happening. These, those people over there are laughing. Those people over there are getting some good work done and you kind of you almost step back from it. But the domestic illustration of this, I'm going to give a gender to it, but it could be either gender. It's the woman sitting at a Sunday table, having worked hard for the last hours to cook a meal, but finds herself sitting quietly at the dinner table, looking upon her family, and enjoying them because something about this moment is truly sacred and none of the attention is coming her way she just gets it and she's deeply fulfilled by by the encounter really so servant leadership is is always described here as People flourishing. Now, it's not always easy. Jesus said that. And he himself, you know, experienced it harshly. But it is what we were born for. The second of the three characteristics, a diversity. You know, a family in a Catholic context is not a group of people who look, think and act the same. And that's why the, dot, the, the chapter makes a really good attempt to say, look, expect to see all these different kinds of roles. Meet the family. In the family is a pope, a cardinal, an archbishop, episcopal vicars, canons, priests, deacons, religious orders, chaplains, the laity, non-believers and the poor. There's your family. All right. And be careful. Be careful that they're all there. It's very interesting that sometimes one of the ends of those two, that paradigm drops off. So the second illustration, if you like, of, of servant leadership is one who bears the tensions between that kind of diversity. All are welcome. We sing it, but a, a servant leader holds it. And that leads me to the last one, because I'm, I'm, time's up. And that is something I really love about Pope Francis. He does really well in all of his documents. He says, you know, a Catholic family is always getting bigger. 
Now, before you panic and think, oh my goodness, does that mean I've got to have a bigger school or bigger numbers? It doesn't mean that. What it actually means is that gradually, subtly, our circle of concern invites other people into the family, whatever that means. So the Catholic school reaches beyond its gates into the lives and the hearts of the neighborhood and the families around. Um, I don't know whether you came across Reed Hastings uh, on Radio 4, but if you don't know Reed Hastings, he's the founder of Netflix. And one of the things, he's looking for universal stories. And one of the things he says is, in a crisis, such as a pandemic, there are two reactions. Think about this for a minute, two reactions. The first reaction is to sink into yourself, you know, buy that toilet paper. In fact, buy everybody's toilet paper, or even worse, buy all the medication. Because we, th we think often by anxiety of our own concern. But there's another, there's another reaction to chaos, and that is to move beyond ourselves. And that's the profoundly Christian view of the world, to, to move beyond ourselves, that none of us can hide any more from the fate of all of us. That's one of the remarkable things that COVID-19 has done for the world. It says none of us can remove ourselves from the fate of all of us. And that's very in tune with Pope Francis, who will say gradually, subtly, our arms extend, extend into a greater circle. So it leaves me with this, and I just will finish with this, even though I keep saying it. I want you to think of yourself as a member of a family, a family which is motivated, progressive, but is also hurting. A family which is diverse and a family um, which cares about education. That's us. And your role in it, wherever you find yourself in your career, is to see yourself in many respects as a member of that family. I. Uh, I think of a newly qualified teacher who might be teaching for the first time this September, worried this summer about whether she's going to fit in and can she do the job and will the children love her and will her colleagues respect her and will the head teacher listen to her? And the Lord says, don't worry, don't worry, because that school is a family and I've been preparing them for a long time for your coming and I can't wait for you to meet them. That's who we are, that's why we are. And that's what we are. So get yourselves around chapter seven sometime and have a look at it. And Sarah, over to you. Thank you, David. Absolutely wonderful. So before we move over to either listen to or, or, um, <clears throat> or hear some comments from or questions from people, just the points to remember from the chapter. We all have an important role in the family. The clergy and religious are here to serve and want to serve. As humans, however, we all fail. So if you find someone falling short of the mark, have the courage to discuss it with them. And the final point, the church needs you. So um, some, also some points for personal reflection or discussion, which might be coming up actually in the points that we've got here in the chat already. What do you think about the model of servant leadership? And to what degree, if any, do you feel part of the family 
where you are now. And finally, as a learning community, how do you feel you can grow closer to the family model? So, lots of meat there. Let's have a look. My friend Daisy, Daisy, I feel like I know you well now. Um, you, have, you have a question for us. Thank you very much. Um, if you went into a school, what would you expect good servant leadership to look like in reception as someone who's new going into that year group? So what would you expect good servant leadership to look like in reception? Now, I happen to know that reception class is not David's speciality. So I'm not going to put that, although he may wish to comment on it. But is there anyone here who would like to offer up a few? Sister Judith, would you like to start us off? Uh, I'll unmute. I've unmuted you. Oh, oh, thanks ever so much. Thank you. Uh, Daisy, that, that's a fantastic question. What would it look like? in reception nursery reception early years well daisy it would look the same throughout you know we are the, the greatest gift to our family is to be who we are not to try and be somebody we're not and we're trying to as we've said several times over we're trying to be the hands the heart the eyes the ears of jesus christ and we know how much he absolutely loves the little the little ones and we also know the story well don't we when the big ones the apostles trying to shoo the little ones away and and you know what little children are like you've seen it many times when somebody special has come to their classroom that they don't normally have in their classroom they just flock to them don't they they very quickly want a piece of them and it's that respect for each one of the children that's it's that attentiveness it's that ability to make every child feel that they're the only one in the world. I see so many uh, early years teachers have a real gift for that. And I so wish right through the system that we all had that, or let's say we all reclaim it, that every child feels that they're the only one in the world and you're there for them. You're there for them. And some people, as, as David said so rightly, get it a bit wrong. Um, it's not about constantly making people feel dependent on you and forever clearing up after them. No, no, it's not. It's, it's about you being who you are, made in the image of God, but also you're the, you're the unique model, but allowing those children to be that too. And that's what we're serving, bringing them, as David said, to full flourishment, to be that wonderful little person but each child wants a piece of you and they're very demanding, as you know, Daisy, extremely. <laughs> they will be on your ankles, they will be on your, the, you know, on your jumper, they'll be poking and pulling. But they're so longing to learn from you and that's our service to them, to open them up, enable them to become that. It's going to be difficult when they come back because not all of them, sadly, but some of them have not had the right kind of attention for a very long time now. And that's going to be very demanding on you. And the other problem is the children that have had undiluted parents uh, at their beck and call, some might possibly have been giving in to them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be the case. And they're going to want even more of you. But our service to those children help them to become who they really are and to flourish, as David said. I know, Daisy, you'll be great at that. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely great at it. But it's not going to be easy, particularly for you, yeah. you know, because they've got mummy, and mummy, daddy, nan, whoever, 100% uh, of the time. And that's not normal in their lives. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Sister Judah. David, I'm sorry, I cut across you. Was there anything you wanted to say, my friend? <laughs> No, I think you're absolutely right. I, I walk into reception classes in schools and am generally humbled by the experience. And, um, my, my commitment was mainly to 14 to 18 year olds. Um, so for me, it's a very alien environment. But actually, I, I have to say on many occasions, like Sister describes, I've been truly moved by what I see there, really. So 
my conviction, even just looking at Daisy, is because she's got the question, uh, my suspicion is she'll have the answer too. So go, girl, do your best. Do your best. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, David. Anthony, if you'd like to open up your microphone and ask your question, please. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, David. Um, hi, Anthony. Uh, my question was, and I know you said that we all play a role in this, but as a leader, when we look at our society, there are lots of prominent issues and examples of injustice. Um, so in our schools now, how would you approach the healing of our family, both like in, in our local area and beyond that? Something that I don't know, can I just encourage you to um, take a look at the podcast series or have a listen to the podcast series on Radio 4 at the moment. It's called Rethink and uh, it's quite, quite beautiful. Um, some of it's quite secular. It's not a religious resource, but Pope Francis is in there. He's amongst those um, following his interview with Austin Ivory a few weeks ago. Um, one of the things that Pope Francis is calling the church back to, and when I hear that, I think of people like us, really, is he's saying we've got to rediscover contemplation, um, that we've got to build into our professional lives things like this. And I'm very grateful to Sarah for, for inviting me to be part of this. Why? His answer is that poverty and victimization is bashful and he uses the word bashful and what he says is in a, in our own postcodes are are the poor and victims of injustice but they're bashful they're camouflage and he cites the example of of an incident in rome in which a policeman ushered a man on the streets during the curfew of lockdown and said, go home. And the man said very powerfully, and of course it was caught on film, this is my home. I've got nowhere to go. But he was in a suit. Now, the reason the Pope was quite struck by that is he says, unless I can see and actually to some extent feel the pain of my community, um, I, I can't respond and enable the healing of it. And, and I know this is really tough on you people because I, I am very proud of what I see everywhere. Truly, it moves me deeply what I see in our schools. Um, but actually, I think if we've learned anything in the last few months, it's to build in time to think and contemplate because it will take us to the needs of the, the, the people we are, if you like, who are in our family. And um, what does that mean? I think once the Lord shows it to us, I think people like you know what to do. I mean, it can be overwhelming, so I'm not asking you to be a fix-all for, for all of society's ills. Um, but there is time now to, to really do what Pope Francis is doing and saying, you know, where we meet injustice and 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 tragedy, the first response of a family is to listen to it, to really hear it. And um, I'm not even sure, Anthony, whether I'm starting the answer of your question or, or managing to confuse it a little bit. No, I appreciate it. And I, I can understand what you're saying. I think it's probably the right time to reflect now, isn't it? When we've got a little bit more, I suppose, time on our hands compared to usual. Was there a particular aspect of society's discomfort or, or the injustice that you see around you that prompted the question? I think you know, for the children, if the, the children will probably be com they're coming in with lots of questions about what they've been seeing on the news. Um, so, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests will be quite prominent in their thoughts, I would imagine. Um, and then the aspects of society where you know we we do find children who are on social media a lot younger than they should be and they might be seeing things that you know are not necessarily for their age group so it's just a it's about maybe our approach to you know maybe healing that in in them as well you know for the things that they probably shouldn't have seen but we we have our duty to protect them from as well thank you 
Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, David. Um, our friends Hayley and Connor are back, but remember they've got no camera or microphone, so I'm going to ask their question for them. Can you suggest any practical examples for encouraging servant leadership in the children in our school? Would it look different for a child in year one compared to a child in year six? Now we've, we've kind of already answered that. In fact, Sister Judith started on that one, but is there anything else there, any more practical examples for encouraging servant leadership in the children in our schools? And I'll throw that open to the floor. Anyone who'd, who'd like to have a go, raise your hand or um, open up your microphone, give it a go. Any suggestions of practical examples for encouraging servant leadership in our schools? Martin, I'm looking at you, my friend. Would you like to start? See, that's what happens when you're a friend of Sarah's, you get picked upon. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Um, okay, so I think servant leadership is really about serving the common good and meeting others where they are. So the most important thing really has to be to get to know your class and for your class to get to know the world through the experiences you're offering through curriculum. So the big questions of purpose and meaning that we were talking about over the past few weeks that should permeate the curriculum are enabling those children to understand how their gift that they bring to the world is a gift of service. And if your curriculum effectively does that, and if that's the purpose of you going into curriculum, they'll get servant leadership and they'll get it on a level that's relevant to them. So for me, the difference in year group is that you're offering a different curriculum. You're enabling them to meet different people and places through the text that you'll share, through the, the places that you'll visit in geographical study, through the experiences that you'll explore through history and so on. So bringing the children to that and then applying it to their lives so that they can use their gift is the only way to get them to understand how to use their gifts for social transformation, for servant leadership. Lovely, thank you, Martin. Um, it just reminded me, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure we've got a whole variety of people from uh, across the country here, but the CAFOD website, um, the come and see units for the summer term are, are on the CAFOD website and they're all, um, all about stewardship. Um, and they go uh, right from reception up to year six. So if you haven't looked for those, have a look on the CAFOD website. They are designed to go with the Come and See programme, but they're usable standalone. Sister Judith is waving at me, and it's not just because she loves me. Ah, uh, it is indeed, Sarah. Um, just to share with you, I think a lot of you probably saw last night on the news the most wonderful, wonderful um, example of the little five-year-old boy who has no legs who walked every day in June um, for, for, for hospital. That little boy's raised over a million and a quarter pounds. He's, he's five. And he was inspired by uh, that wonderful, wonderful Captain Tom, wasn't he? So I think that little children are capable of enormous understanding. And when his adoptive parents said you know he, it, that's why he did it because he watched captain tom he was inspired by him and at just five that little lad took off and he's only recently got his new his new legs um but he wanted to play his part he's five there's a huge lesson there brilliant thank you sister judith so moving on, Candice, would you like to open up your microphone, please? Oh, hello. I'm not sure if my video is working. That's okay. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my question is, can you suggest any uh, quick questions or policies that we can ask ourselves for our reflection? Um, when we're considering if we are or our children are being a servant leader. So did you get that, David? It's there in the chat, but I'll read it again for you because um, Candice was breaking up a bit. Can you suggest any key questions or qualities to ask ourselves 
in reflection to consider if we or our children are being a servant leader? Any questions for us to reflect upon? Um, if, if I took, look, look, by the way, sorry, Candice, that's gorgeous. Um, the problem when we get into this territory, of course, is that we're all wanting. So can I just, just begin by saying, like, don't forget, please, to pray for the grace to be the thing we're talking about. Um, and then I would say, because I don't want people on a guilt trip, you know, we are good people and we're doing the best we can. All right. Uh, so I don't want people going off this feeling bad, but I, I am going to I am going to suggest that everybody I think listening to this knows what it feels like when the people around them are growing. So it's unlikely that everybody on your staff or everybody or every child in your classroom, you know, is going to be flourishing in any one moment. But I would look for small victories as much as you can. Look, look for little signs that say, hey, she wouldn't have said that three weeks ago. And she's saying it now. She's putting her hand up and I'm seeing flourishing. That's one. The second, in my opinion, is that really we're treating diversity with equality. Everybody is valued in this classroom, all right? in the same way. Um, one of the things I notice whenever they do uh, surveys of children or young people and, and they ask them, what do you want most in a teacher? The answer is almost always consistently fairness. Be just. So the, the second thing is, you know, like, is, is diversity being treated with dignity? And then the third thing I think would probably be that that last thing that I mentioned just is, is are our hearts getting bigger? And by that, I don't mean is your school getting bigger. I just mean, are we acute to and attentive to the disappointments and the brokenness around us? You know, are the children in our classes saying, Miss, I saw this on the news and I want to do something, you know? Her sister's dead right. We've had children in some of our schools setting up food banks. And, and it's because kids, kids don't like unfairness. They really, really, really are born with a sense of, of, of justice. And they want to meet adults who feel like that too. That's what they want. They want to they wanna, they wanna walk into a classroom and go, this, this adult feels it the way I feel it. You know, they don't want the environment to be burned. Um, and, and they want justice. They do look for justice. So I guess, even though I'm not as good as I could be, you know, they're looking for examples of it in us more than anything. Okay, Candice. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yasmin. Welcome back. If you'd like to open up your microphone. Oh, and a camera as well. Well done. <laughs> um, hi. So my question was, um, in teaching children to follow Jesus through caring for others, how do we teach them to discern when it's time to step in? and help another person and when it's better to leave them be so the other person can grow through their struggle so um wow that's a that's, that's a, a big question yeah well it, it takes a lifetime doesn't it i'm just thinking of my three kids who are all in their 20s and and have i even done that for them um you know, have I molly coddled them when I shouldn't? Have I stood back when I shouldn't? I mean, gosh. Um, but I, I, I would say this. Pope Francis is offering a pastoral strategy. George, I found sounds very grand. But there, there'd be three elements to it. And I think that there's something about these three elements that answers your question. The first is being able to listen is critical. Um, and that's hard for a teacher because there are so many voices. And then the second thing is, is being able to discern 
in the child or the member of staff what the issue properly is because sometimes it's not what it presents itself as and then thirdly is enabling them to take the third step the pope talks about that as as perceiving the next step being able to to help the child make the next step themselves it all sounds so easy when i, I offer a formula like that to listen to discern and, and to perceive what the next step is but but, you know, I, I marvel at your question because sometimes the teacher's answer is, I think you should go back and say this. And sometimes the teacher's answer is to step in. Um, but goodness, you know, there requires wisdom, prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit. And I would love to say I'm, I'm good at it and I have no idea. <laughs> sometimes I get it right and sometimes I don't. Sarah, what are you like at that? Why don't you answer a question? Well, <laughs> funnily enough, I was just thinking, David, it's hard enough to discern for yourself, mm. but to discern on behalf of someone else is, is such a big thing. And it's such dangerous ground, isn't it? Because you, you can think you know what the Lord wants for someone else and you can convince yourself that that's the right thing for them to do or them to say or you to do on their behalf. But it's, it's, it's such tricky ground, isn't it? And it, it's, and I think that that see, judge, act model, which I was just in the middle of um, typing up on there, that that see, judge, act is is really helpful for us. But there can be a danger, can't there, that we can misinterpret other people's feelings or actions or or what they actually want. And I think we've talked uh, on here before, haven't we, about that that skin to skin experience, about really listening to someone and what it is, and sometimes a child's behaviour will actually be what you're listening to um, and, and they might not have the words to express it but um, you're looking and listening for all sorts of different things and sometimes it's it's patterns of behaviour or what people are saying um, but we make a mistake don't we sometimes in, ju in jumping in too soon which is why I think Yasmin your question was was just beautiful because it is a really big question it's that knowing when to act knowing when to wait because actually sometimes you're right people do need to be able to grow through their struggle and learn from it and they don't learn from it if we're always trying to tell them what the answer is well we're, we're helping people find the answer but that's not the same as telling them is it no i think, so I think from what you both said um kind of about it's, it's really about enabling children and kind of trying to spot actually what is it that this person is in need of at the moment to enable them to do what they need to do. So it might be um, just giving them a small skill, it might be several skills like we scaffold in teaching all the time, or it might be um, sometimes um, giving them a firm word. <laughs> Absolutely. Kind of, you know, make them pay attention. Thanks. Thank you, Yasmin. Fabulous yes, question. Yes, I think yes. it's made everyone else think, I'm not asking anything now, that's far too no. clever a question. Well, just before we go on that, um, one of the things I marvel at amongst teachers is, and I see this regularly, is Yasmin, you're probably quite good at asking a question. And I noticed that quite often Jesus asks questions before he proffers answers. You know, why are you asking me that? Why are you calling me good? Uh, why are you making me an arbiter of you and your brother? So I, I think good teachers are really kind of good at saying, you know, the kids says are the big kids at, at the new school. And, and a good teacher will, will hear that, say, are you frightened? Are you scared? You know, it's, it's the ability to listen to something and then prompt the next question. I'm amazed at how good people in the teaching profession are at, at that. But, but, you know, it's a gift. Absolutely. Thank you, David. And thank you again, Yasmin. Um, so from Sam and Carly um, at Sacred Heart, in children with very limited life experiences, how do you instill the idea that they have the ability to be world changers? Um, can, can I defer back to the Educarum website, because 
Sister Judith says this, you know, the purpose of a Catholic school is transformation uh, so that we transform the world. And I'd love to hear her say just a little bit more about that. because I Absolutely. Guess Sister Judith, I have unmuted you. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you for that question. It's a very, 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 very good one. Um, what we have to find in every child, we talked about this way back, is their gift, regardless of their life experience, you know, whether it's been very close, very sort of cosseted, very wrapped up in what I call bubble wrap and everything lovely, or whether it's been quite raw and everything in between. Our task as teachers is to help them find the gift because what you know what happens when a child suddenly hears you say that is amazing what you've just done or say they light up don't they and when you begin to to bring out in a child what they're really good at and say to them now I'm, I'm going to help you with this more work you're so good at it and that you find lots of opportunities during the term to turn to that child and say you're the one with this gift you're the one to lead us and help us with this even though they may not be at the time but you're what you're doing is you're drawing out that potential that gift and that's what transforms the person when we feel that our unique gift is real it's not somebody patronizing us but it's real and that it is wanted and we can use it even if we're a bit scared of it and grown-ups are scared of it never mind children um then we start to take risks and when we take risks our gift flourishes we flourish as david was saying but it's the gift that starts to really really flourish it's that einstein thing again you know your children aren't all the same your children he says you know you know this well you know, if you tell a fish it's got to climb a tree it spends its life thinking it's stupid in your class you've got fish but you've also got eagles and they do not do the same thing they do not know how to do the same thing and they're not meant to do the same thing which really calls into question everything that's going on in our education system because we've got a one-size-fits-all but when we let our fish plummet the depths of the ocean and reveal to us what they've discovered transformation both of them and of ourselves really starts to happen and when we let our eagles soar really soar uh, the same thing happens but you as the teacher we have to bring the two together the eagle to speak to the fish the fish to speak to the eagle and you get an understanding of life that you never thought possible in such a young child and, and to go back to the little fellow whose name i've forgotten actually um the little fellow last night at only five he he can't walk without crutches and artificial legs but boy that boy has soared he is soaring he is flying and he is teaching us and he might even be shaming some of us <laughs> you know so the transformation comes about in using your gift that little boy's heart is enormous and that little boy from his earliest days has known brutality that has been unbelievable and yet the love of his adoptive parents have trans have transformed him and now he's flying thank you thank you sister judith um and in fact thank you to all of you great to see all of our family back again um next week we have sister ellen mccarthy coming to talk to us about the do's and the don'ts of the liturgical year i'm just going to finish with the prayer from the the chapter and then David and Sister Judith and Martin and anyone else who'd like to join in for the wash up, please do stay. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, grant me your hope that I may know the value of living. Grant me your strength that I may have courage whatever happens. Grant me your patience 
that I pause before I judge. Grant me your wisdom that I discover how to learn from the children. Grant me your mercy that I may temper my discipline. Grant me your peace that I may become an instrument of reconciliation. And in all things, flood me in your joy that I may keep alight the flame of your love. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Another week done. Fabulous, David, to have you back with us. Great to have all of you here. I hope you have a fabulous week. May your reading of the guidance be accompanied by a glass of something jolly. And we'll see you all next week. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Many, many thanks, David. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Oh, all the thanks coming in the chat now, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, David, was again brilliant. Thank you, everyone else also. God bless. Thank you. Could, could I ask something? Would that be possible, Sarah? Go for it, Yasmin. Go for it. Um, thanks. Um, I, I, I'm doing something. Um, I'm writing something uh, for next week. I know it's quite short notice and... It's to share with, um, oh, can you not hear me? No, it's all right, I can now. My son was putting the kettle on, helpfully. <laughs> okay. I'll mute uh, while you talk. Thanks. I'm, I'm writing something for next week for um, some of the uh, students that are um, training in our school. And I was just wondering if um, Sister Judith Sister Judith Vaughan, Sister Judith, sorry, I'm looking at my screen because on my computer I can see everybody who's here. Um, or uh, David, if somebody would just be able to go over it to make sure it's theologically sound beforehand. I know it's short notice. If you can't, then that's, uh, it's okay, I understand. I'll ask somebody else. But um, I just thought if you could help, that would be good. Hello, are you there? Hi. Hi. Hi, Yasmin. Uh, mm. David, what do you think? I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm.